Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a bunch of fascinating, and I mean fascinating, sequels to Dvorak's New World Symphony. Now, I've already given a talk on Dvorak's New World Symphony, so we need to return for a moment to the balmy days of 1893. The Dvorak had just been performed, and at the same time, Dvorak was widely quoted, widely, I mean, widely quoted everywhere in Europe and, and, and in the U.S. as having said that an American school of music should be or could be founded on Negro and American Indian melodies. Well, that set off a huge storm. You should see the literature. There were people being asked in Europe about that statement, about whether it was possible, about whether it was conceivable, about whether divorce could even have meant such a thing. Because of course, the American Indian and Negro peoples were widely considered, especially by white Western Europe, to be inferior and somehow subhuman, if not, you know, culturally, then certainly racially. And it was believed that this was an impossible statement. But Dvorak was, of course, quite serious about it because Dvorak had lived through it himself as a Czech composer who had to make a living basically in Germany, where the Czechs were somewhat looked down on. He really, truly believed that this was possible and he thought that he had done it himself. And more to the point, the New World Symphony was regarded as, as an example of what he had in mind. Even though all the tunes were original, it was widely believed and discussed and thought that the melodies were, if not actual Negro and American Indian melodies, melodies, then strongly influenced by them, which in fact they probably were, at least to a degree. So there was a little bit of truth in it. But the fact of the matter is the, as usual with music, I mean, this is so typical of what happens with music. And this is another wonderful example about how people would rather talk about it than listen to it. And of course, the discussions were, were going wild. And it was much harder to listen to it in those days, of course, because we didn't have recordings and people couldn't play the New World Symphony. And even if they could, they wouldn't have known what they were listening to. And they wouldn't have cared because they were having much more fun jabber, 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 jabbering about the horrifying possibility that America American music could indeed be based on Negro and American Indian melodies. And at least as far as Negro melodies go or African American melodies, um, that's exactly what happened. It only didn't happen in the fields of classical music so much, but rather in jazz and popular music, which as we know, was a combination essentially of African American influence and Eastern European Jewish influence. Um, and the result was George Gershwin and Tin Pan Alley and, and jazz and all of those wonderful things, which we regard as quintessentially American, which had very little to do with white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture. So there. But until that happened, the world of classical music was just abuzz with horror. It was just such a wonderful thing. And it's fascinating reading and research now. And one of the most direct responses to this controversy was, you ready for this, folks? Amy Beach, Amy Beach's Gaelic Symphony. Now, Amy Beach was the very model of the proper Boston upper crust matron, but she was also a composer and a composer of considerable substance, conservative and European down to the core. Now, her, she was so conservative, she signed her name Mrs. H.H.A. Beach, and so she was sort of known in New England conservatory circles as Ha Ha, you know, Ha Ha Beach. And I thought that was really kind of fun and rather appropriate, actually. These two p big pieces on this disc, her piano concerto and her symphony, they're the only two large orchestral works that she wrote. And she wrote the symphony directly as a response to the controversy engendered by Dvorak's New World Symphony. This isn't to say that Haha was a racist. I don't know if she was or if she wasn't. What I do know is that she believed 
that there was no reason that American music needed to be founded on Negro or American Indian melodies because it could just as easily be founded on white people's folk melodies, meaning Anglo-Irish folk tunes. And so she wrote her Gaelic Symphony, which uses four of them at least, and some more that were written in similar style. And it's a lovely work. It's a lovely work in, in four movements, in traditional form, and and it's really very, very nice, and the tunes are terrific, and it's really fun to listen to and think about it as a reaction to Dvorak's New World Symphony, which, to be honest, I mean, it doesn't really hold a candle to the New World Symphony, but it's a good effort by a good, solid composer. I'm going to play you a little bit of the finale of the Gaelic Symphony so you can see what her tunes sounded like and what she was about. So get ready. Here it comes. bad, right? It's attractive, pleasant music written in the wake, the immediate wake of Dvorak's New World Symphony. So next on the agenda, the New World Symphony, of course, became incredibly, incredibly popular and it was performed everywhere. And one of the reasons it was performed was because of the titillation people got from the exotic idea that it was based on African American and, and American Indian or Native American Melodies, that was part of its fun, its primitive, exotic, you know, all of that stuff. It had sort of a classical prurient interest, but it also sparked interest among other repressed peoples, not the least of whom were the Irish. <laughs> and they felt that there should be a competition to write a symphony based on Irish melodies, just as Dvorak's had been based on African-American and and. Native American tunes, which of course it wasn't, but they didn't know that. They didn't care because it was much more exciting to think that it was. And that's the point. And one of the people who actually wrote a symphony in response to a contest to or a festival commission to do something was Hamilton Hardy, who wrote his Irish symphony in 1904 revised several times up through the 1920s afterwards. And this was also in the wake of Dvorak's New World Symphony. Now, I played this symphony. We did it in my community orchestra. It's a beautiful, beautiful work, very polished, extremely well put together. And the tunes are gorgeous. And it's much more ethnic sounding than Amy Beach's symphony is. You know, she tended to sort of conservatively westernize everything she touched. But the Irish symphony really sounds Irish. And here's a bit of the, the trio section of the scherzo, which is, which is subtitled, I think it's like Fair Day. Yes, it's, it's the Fair Day, as in fair, as in party, as in, you know, festival. And the tune, you'll, you'll know this tune. It's The Girl I Left Behind Me, right? Here it is. So that was Hamilton Hardy's version. And now you see two interesting reactions to Dvorak's New World Symphonies by composers who were 
predisposed to operate within the conservative German symphonic tradition. However, things get really interesting when we start looking at that first early 20th century generation of African American composers who took the, the model of Dvorak, the inspiration of Dvorak, and ran with it. And those composers included, of course, people who wrote popular music too, because if you listen and you listen to my little talk on Dvorak's humoresques, you hear, you hear the influence of ragtime and Joplin and, and really African-American music. It's in there, you know, that the pop music ethos, you know, the Tin Pan Alley vernacular is starting to form. And Dvorak heard it and he incorporated it into his piano humoresques. And basically, a whole series of composers between 1930 and 1933, African-American composers, took Dvorak's example very, very much to heart. Now, remember, the New World Symphony became part of African-American culture. One of Dvorak's African-American pupils took the second movement tune and turned it into a quasi-spiritual called Going Home. You know, da, 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 da. And you can still hear it played at African-American and non-African-American funerals in the United States somewhat frequently. It's a very, very popular spiritual tune. And it came from the symphony, not the other way around. For many years, people thought that Dvorak got it. It was a spiritual that Dvorak borrowed, but it's really the opposite. So there was always this kind of cross-fertilization. And one of the best composers who took Dvorak's model very much to heart was William Grant Still. And he wrote five symphonies, and they're very, very good pieces. He was a very serious composer of considerable substance and, and an ethnic composer, one who tried to write serious Western style for Western style ensembles, as in the symphony orchestra, concert music, using an, a, a, an African-American idiom, if not necessarily quoting actual themes. And his first symphony is the Afro-American Symphony. And I'm going to play you a little bit of the opening because you hear an, a soulful melody on the English horn and you can tell Dvorak is not far behind. This is the earliest of the three African-American symphonies we're going to listen to from 1930. Can you hear the bit of Dvorak? Can you hear the influence, the inspiration? But the rest of the piece is, is very much Still's own, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful piece, and he's a wonderful composer. And all of the symphonies have been recorded by Naxos. A couple of them were done by Nimi Yarvi on Chandos. They're beautiful works, and you should know them. You really should know them. The other marvelous, marvelous example from exactly the same period by another African-American composer is uh, William Dawson's Negro Folk Symphony. Now this was composed in 1932 and it was picked up by Leopold Stokowski, of all people, a couple of times actually. He programmed it with uh, a certain regularity and it, it is a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of music. Dawson lived to be 91. I mean, his dates were, were let's see, it was, it was 1899 to 1990. But after he wrote this symphony, he didn't write any others. He, he worked basically in choral music and music arranging and, and other aspects of the music industry. And it's a pity because he was also a composer of genuine substance. And the Negro Folk Symphony is a 
beautiful work. It has three movements. Um, they're marked uh, The Bond of Africa, Hope in the Night, and Oh, Let Me Shine, Shine Like a Morning Star. The tunes that he uses are not the familiar spirituals. I, I, I don't know them. You probably won't know them. So you don't need to know them. But they're in there. They're in there. And the, the second movement, the slow movement, is incredibly passionate and moving. It's, it's a threnody, essentially, almost a funeral march, which is, is leavened by an attempt to brighten, brighten the mood only to return to, to the opening. And it's, it's a piece that's very, very much influenced by African-American history and, and the, the, the history and the story of slavery in America. And it couldn't be a more topical work for where we are today, I mean, I really think, but it is absolutely beautiful. Here's a little bit of the slow movement. Very, very moving, isn't it? It's a wonderful, wonderful work. But we're going to close on a lighter note because at the same time, I mean the very same, it's amazing that Still and Dawson were at work. So was Florence Price, the first African-American woman to write a symphony and have it premiered by a major orchestra in 1933 by the Chicago Symphony. They played her first symphony. And she was also a composer of considerable substance, and she wrote a ton of music. Uh, she was trained at the New England Conservatory, and her first symphony, uh, this is really quite remarkable. Her symphonies, this, is, this disc is on Naxos. It's with um, the Fort Smith Symphony under John Jeter, who also did the Still and, and the Dawson. This is a wonderful series of music by African-American composers. And all of these discs are on Naxos, so I can play examples from all of them for you. But Florence Price substituted for the scherzo something she called a juba dance. And here is the juba dance from the first symphony. It's a hoot, isn't it? Isn't that just wonderful? I mean, you get the slide whistle going in it and all that. It's just terrific. I, I Her first symphony is a very serious work. I have some issues with her handling of like sonata form in the first movement. She was also a New England composer, just like Amy Beach was. And so her treatment of form is somewhat traditional and I think a little bit clumsy in her first movements, but the music has character. And that's what you want. You want character. I mean, you, you hear it and you know that Duke Ellington and and you know the the great flowering initial flowering in this country of of African American jazz and popular music is not far behind because they're all drawing from the same well, and so these five works: Beach, Hardy, Still, Dawson, and Price. Five of them, five symphonies, all of which can be linked directly back to the example 
of Dvorak's New World Symphony. Whether they understood what it meant or did what Dvorak intended is an open question. The argument over what really constitutes American music is a fascinating one because the answer is all of it does. It's not an either or proposition. It never was. And I think that was Dvorak's message, not necessarily Amy Beach's idea, but Dvorak's method, message and his example was one of inclusion. It was inclusion while at the same time asserting the right of composers to express their genius and individuality in personalizing their influences. And of course, genius is something that you can't predict. You either have it or you don't. And if you do, it doesn't matter where you're getting your influences from, does it? You're going to turn out something splendid. But all of these recordings are on Naxos. They are all worth hearing. Uh, there are more, there's more than one of Florence Price. You can find some. The Still series has a couple of discs in it. Dawson, unfortunately, only wrote this single work. You've got Hamilton Hardy's music, which is a joy. It's wonderful stuff. And Amy Beach's Piano Concerto, which is coupled with the symphony, makes a fantastic disc. These are all well, well, well worth hearing and worth your time. And if you know and love the New World Symphony, I think listening to this music with that piece in mind is going to give you an entirely different perspective and frame of mind in which to enjoy some very fine music by composers you may not have heard of. So please, please keep on listening and enjoy these splendid sequels to Dvorak's New World Symphony.